thanks, thanks Andre. Dear colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to start this uh, in today's lecture on chronic inflammation. I actually had to beg Andre for several months before I finally got invited. Now we'll start off by giving you an overview. So giving an overview implies that I won't give you too much detail, but I'd like to tickle your interest. So uh, why, why should you even care about renal in, in inflammation? First, because it's very frequent. Around 10% of the Western population has some sort of chronic kidney damage. And as a rule of thumb, the immune system is involved in almost all of these. And for most of these diseases, there's no treatment. So this is an area where there's a lot of room for innovation. What I would like to talk about, my agenda, I would like to start by why the kidney shouldn't inflame at all. Then second, what you know, makes the kidney the target organ for inflammation. And in the end, I would like to focus on the pathogenesis of acute kidney injury, and finally on lupus nephritis to also set the stage a little bit for antibony. So let's start off why there should not be kidney in inflammation. And to understand this, we have to look at the kidney function. And what you see here is, is, is a nephron, which is the smallest functional unit of the kidney. So what happens is that the blood enters here, and it's filtered here, and the urine is produced, it's transported, and it leaves within the body. So, and this is what you see under the microscope. Here you have this, have this filter station, and then you have uh, uh, a tubular systems which trans transport the urine. And we, is it working now? Yeah, at least the pointer. At least the pointer, okay. Um, so, um, um, we, we, we have to look at this, in, at this filter station. So blood enters here, and it's kind of the, the fluids are pressed out of there, and so the urine is pr produced. And this filter is uh, composed out of three layers, endothelial cells, a base membrane, and uh, polocytes. And the, and the nature of this, uh, of this filter is it's not absolutely tight. So besides fluids and e electrolytes, we would filter peptides, and depending on size and charge, also proteins. And so, yeah, as a general rule, proteins up to the size of albumin at least partly pass this, uh, this filter. So we have here this filter station, the glomerulum. We have peptides and proteins leaving here. And since the body doesn't want to lose them, he, he, he takes them back via the tubular system. And now, if we look at the kidney again and stain for 3CO1 and stain uh, dendritic cells, we see that this tubular system is surrounded by a dense network of dendritic cells. So here we have an, have an organ which constantly filtrates peptides and protein antigens out of one of our most precious compartments, the, the, the blood, and presents them to the dendritic cells, and then, of course, other immune cells. So it makes sense to assume that this is a system that should be rather prone not to induce uh, immunity, but rather to tolerate cells. And there's some mouse data on that. For instance, if you inject mice with, with over an albumin, Here's the renal lymph nodes, and now here, this is the dermal lymph nodes, here's the renal lymph nodes. Very quickly, in 90 seconds, this antigen appears in the renal lymph nodes, and after five minutes, it's even more. And if you compare the antigen lo localization, after 10 and 30 minutes, in different lymph nodes, and the spleen, you see that the spleen and the renal lymph nodes are one of the major organs where soluble protein antigens end up. And if you see, look, look now, what happens if you challenge T cells with this antigen, this is how a normal adjuvant-supported uh, immunization looks like. If T cells proliferation producing into from gamma and I2, you look at the renal lymph nodes, <coughs> immunization without adjuvants, there's less into from gamma and hardly any I2. And these authors also report there's less cytotoxicity, uh, more on apoptosis, and claim that these cells are, are tolerized in a PDL1D dependent manner. So, do you have any hints that this also happens in humans and can we break this, uh, the, this tolerance? And uh, over the last two years, uh, around five years, we've seen the rise of checkpoint blockade and inhibitors. So now routinely in the clinics, patients are getting treated with anti cd 4 and PD-1 antibodies. And some of these patients, for instance, these patients under treatment with checkpoint blockade inhibitors, de develop renal failure. And if you look at this renal failure, you see T cells invading the, the kidney. So seemingly, this tolerance can be, can be broken. But if we look at how often this happens, here's different checkpoint inhibitors, like a CTLA-4 blocker and PDA-1 blocker, 
This is autoimmune skin disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, endocrine disorders, hepatitis, and renal disorders. You see that renal disorders occur, but it's much less frequent than autoimmune manifestations in, in, in other organs. So it seems that this tolerance can be broken, but it seems it's kind of hard to, to, to break. Now, having said this, what makes the kidney the target organ then in so many immune-mediated diseases? And if you, if you look at it, it's really a broad spectrum. You have, it starts with post uh, streptococcal cl glomerulonephritis, hepatitis C, cryoglobulins, of course lupus, anchor vasculitis, IgA, diabetes, which is more and more appreciated as being immune mediated, and these renal diseases like membranous and chronic proliferative minimal change. And seemingly, always when there's some kind of antibody immune complex circulating, the kidney is a, is a target organ. Now, how did that happen? First, 25% of the blood that exits your heart flows uh, through the kidney. So the kidney sees a lot of blood. So, um, and any time you, you have a circulating immune complex, antibody, anything, the kidney will see a, a, a lot of it. Second, we have this filter, we have this filter station. And I don't know what your everyday life experience with filters is, but I believe it's in the nature of filters that things get stuck there. And if you, if you look at this, this, this membrane, it, it, it's, you can vividly imagine how, how things get, uh, get stuck there. And lastly, I told you that in this filter station, the, the body presses out fluid, which implies that along this glomerular tuft, the blood loses fluid, so it gets, it gets thicker. The proteins in the blood get uh, gets concentrated, and you see this, that the, vis the viscosity rises. And this, of course, implies that there's a higher risk of things getting stuck there. So um, I've got some, uh, th three examples. This is, for instance, a patient which had an angina by uh, streptococci, within the, anti the body produced antibodies, and these antibodies then flock out here in the, in the kidney as Im immune complexes. You can see there's some more cells here than, than, than you would expect. And you see, if you stay in this for IgG or complement, you find it there. And this is an IEM picture. Here's a basal membrane, and this is an immune complex. And you can see it tried to pass through there, and it got stuck. The next example is IgA, where for some reasons um, an IgA antibodies get deposited here in the global glomerulum. You can stain this with using dyes or stain this using immune fluorescence. You see IgA flocks out there and causes inflammation. And third example, lupus, it's, it's a classic. You right away see this looks very in inflammatory. There's extracapillary proliferation here. It's not always that the whole glomerulum is homogeneously affected. You see that this is thicker, and these glomerular tufts uh, look quite normal. And again, if you use immune fluorescence to detect complementary antibodies, you see that this, that this shines. So, so probably in most cases, the inflammation of the kidney is triggered in the, in the global glomerulum. And if we do a renal biopsy and want to uh, de de determine the diagnosis of a renal disease, the pathologist will focus on the, on the global glomerulum. That is where the typical changes occur. However, if you want to know what really drives renal injury, you will find these works which are quite old, they're around uh, 30 years old, but the pathologist looked at big series of, of, of renal biopsies and analyzed what is really correlating with, with renal damage. And you see kind of two types. This type is you see that the glomerular changes, change, but the interstitium looks pretty normal. And here you see a change <coughs> from glomeruli with a lot of interstitial inflammation. And they realized that the glomerular change alone does not cause loss of uh, renal function in the sense of, of clearance. It causes proteinuria, yes, but it will not cause loss of renal function. While the, two, the interstitial inflammation is independently predictive for a loss of, of the, the renal function, which then raises the question, how does the interstitial inflammation drive renal damage? And to, and to illustrate this, I would like to, to take you and uh, look at two uh, renal diseases. And the first was acute kidney injury. Now, um, what is uh, um, acute kidney injury? First, 
it's the most frequent form of, of renal injury. If you go over there in the hospital, around 5% of all hospital patients will have it, and in the ICU, even more. In the ICU, 60% will have acute uh, renal damage. It's, uh, it's independently associated with mortality, so this kills, and depending on the cohort, up to 30% of these patients will have uh, per persistent renal damage. Now, how do we believe this happens? There is any kind of major hit on the, on the, on the patient. This can be, can be sepsis, can be major surgery, heart failure, severe lack of fluids, liver failure. And all this causes an, an insult on the kidney. And in this case, the primary target compartment is not the glomerular system, but this directly hits the tubular system and causes acute tubular injury. And we, we, we use this to de develop a biomarker for this by just counting tubular epithelial cells in the urine. We use this by, by, by flow sensor cytometry. And if we just count these cells, we see if we have here some amount of cells, if we have more damage, one, two, three, three is worse than one, we see with increasing damage, we have more tubular epithelial cells in the urine. And even more importantly, if you compare the patients which have more cells with those which have fewer cells, if you have fewer cells, that is independently of the stage of your acute renal failure, it's, it's better. This is a percent of, of non-recovery. If you have fewer cells, you will re recover your kidney function. If you have more cells, you are less likely to, to do so. But it is known out of mouse models that this is not just a passive insult on the, on the tubular system, but there's, uh, there's immune cells with the usual suspects, neutrophils, macrophages, T cells, and KT cells and B cells invading them. And if you now, for instance, deplete macrophages in the mouse model, this is with macrophages, this is if you take out the macrophages, and if you do this early in the course of acute kidney injury, you will have less damage. So, uh, the, 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 the question is how, how is this driven? You all know that under normal circumstances, cells will die due to um, homeostasis. They can do apoptosis and just be quietly removed. And it's believed once you have this a major hit on the organ, on the kidney, you will have massive death of, of cells by necrosis, pyoptosis, uh, ferroptosis, and a strong release of dams. And they will then in turn trigger immune receptors on the immune cells and on the local cells, which then produce more and more cytokines, which then recruit more immune cells, and this uh, gets into the to double uh, circle. So this is thought to drive a local sterile in, in inflammation. However, this is not all bad. For instance, if you inhibit one of these uh, pattern receptors, TL4, it was realized, at least in the mouse models, that you have less damage. This is uh, normal, and this if, if you block TL4, and then you have more renal damage. And this is if you look at, at damage markers, isotope, you block TL4, there's more damage marker, this is pass, and you have less IL-22. So the idea is uh, that the macrophages are triggered by uh, pattern receptors, produce IL-22, and this helps the uh, epithelial cells regenerate. Okay, so it's, it's now believed that there's probably two phases of, uh, of AKI. There's a first inflammatory phase, and if you deplete immune cells early, it gets better. And then there's a second phase where the immune system helps clean up and helps the organ regenerate. Okay, so so much for acute kidney injury and a sterile inflammation. Now let's, let's have a look at lupus. And here, you will uh, recognize it by now, we have a, have a sketch of the, of the normal kidney. Here you have the tubular system, and here they have the glomerular. And you all know the hallmark of lupus is that there's a loss of tolerance against nuclear antigens. So we have autoantibodies targeting uh, nuclear structures like DNA and others. So in lupus, these autoantibodies and complement will get deposited in the, in the glomerular system, which gets thicker and leaky for, often for proteins. That's what we see in the clinic. But that's not, not the only change that happens. There's also an invasion of immune cells. And as I told you before, this is mainly macrophages, T cells, and also some uh, cells and some B cells. And we've seen uh, um, at the, um, with the example of acute kidney injury that this might be just danger associated patterns driving in cell inflammation. On the other hand, lupus is the paradigmatic disease where we have a loss of tolerance against certain antigens. So this may very well also be an autoantigen-driven process. 
Do you have any, any data to, to, to say so? Um, there's one group who, uh, which has isolated B cells and plasma cells, other renal biopsies uh, of patients, and, and cloned these, uh, these plasma cells and B cells and expressed the, the, the antibodies, and then analyzed which targets do these antibodies that, that of the B cells and plasma cells in the kidney, which antigens do they target. And this is the typical uh, pattern that you see if you have anti-nuclear antibodies. Of course, anti-nuclear antibodies stain the, 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 the nucleus. This would look like this. The, the antibodies expressed out of the kidney looked like, like, like this. Only a minor fraction targeted nuclear, and the main targets were cytosolic antigens. And um, they then worked out that one of the major targets of these antigens is, 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 is limitin. And interestingly, this is a healthy kidney. Limitin is hardly expressed in the healthy kidney. But once it's inflamed, this is upregulated. So we have an invasion of B cells and plasma cells producing um, antibodies against an antigen in the kidney, which is only upregulating once, once it's inflamed. But what about T cells? And I will show you some, some own data. We are interested in, in T cells and human lupus patients. And one of the uh, key findings were, was that we find these T cells in the urine of patients with active nerve nephritis. And if you, if you find something like this, so the first question is always, is this a biomarker? And here you see the amount of C4 T cells in the urine. And here you see the slider, which is a rough score for the disease activity. And Roughly, um, a slightly more than 10 is active disease, and less than 10 is less active disease. Now, the open boxes are patients without renal involvement. And regardless of disease activity, these patients don't have any T cells in the urine. Well, the patients with renal involvement, if they have no disease activity, there's no T cells in the urine, don't get uh, confused by the error. And if they have high disease activity, they have a T cells in the urine. And if you then also look at his histology, you see that all patients with an inflammatory so-called proliferative nephritis, they all have elevated T cells in the urine. So this gives you, a, gives us as a biomarker and uh, a considerable cohort of lupus patients, it gives you a black and white answer whether a given patient has active lupus nephritis. But we're not only interested in biomarkers, we want to use the cells in the urine as a window into the kidney to analyze what is, what is going on there. And you did this by comparing the phenotype of the T cells in the urine and the blood. And as expected, in the urine is enriched for, for memory effector T cells, which express CD40L and KSN67. So this can be interpreted as a signature of recently antigen specific activated T cells. And if you look at the TCR, TCR repertoire of these cells, this is a TCR distribution in peripheral blood and CD4 and CD8 cells, and here's the urine. You see that the TCRs in the, in the urine, which we take as a proxy for the kidney, is more oligoclonal. So there seems to be enrichment of certain clones in there. So the uh, question is, do maybe arch-reactive T cells invade the inflamed kidneys? We wanted to analyze this. However, it's, there's no bona fide good renal antigen known. So we figured, well, it's, it's known, or so, so, so supposedly known, that lupus is associated with a breach of tolerance against nuclear antigens. And as nuclear antigens are also in the kidney, obviously, it might be that nuclear antigen reactive T cells invade the kidney and cause damage there. And to do this, we had to first de detect nuclear antigen reactive T cells in the blood. We started doing go this by T cell libraries. Here's five lupus antigens, SND1, RP70, histones, Roman La, and this is a, con a con control antigen. To translate these figures into box uh, plots, we see that at least for RP70, Rho, and La, we have more antigen reactive T cells in active SID patients with nephritis than in inactive patients and in healthy controls. And the whole sum of auto antigen reactive T cells correlates with the disease activity. And since we didn't completely trust this libraries, we also did this by, by flow size cytology. We see the Arthur method. This is one example. If you don't, don't stimulate the T cells, it looks like this. If you add uh, lupus antigen, you see there's mainly interfungal prone producing T cells, some IL 17 producers, and yeah, some IL 10 and no IL 4 producers. 
who we really were interested in whether we find these cells in the kidney, uh, respectively in the, in the urine. So we took the T cells out of the urine, labeled them with CFSE, and mixed them with, with these blood cells. So the red dots here are T cells originated from the urine and stimulated as, as with, with this antigen. And you see that we were able to really detect uh, antigen reactive T cells in the urine as well. And, we, and if you compare the frequency of these cells in the blood and urine, it seems there's enrichment of nuclear antigen reactive T cells in the urine, which also worked for most antigens using the T cell libraries, which is there, which is below. And my, my, my last slide, since, uh, since B cells reactive as vimentin were, uh, were important in the kidney, we also wanted to know whether we find vimentin reactive T cells in there. So this is again plot from patients with active lupus, inactive lupus, healthy control. This is if you had vimentin, this is a, con a con control antigen. And we also did this with urine. And uh, it seems there's also an enrichment of vimentin reactive T cells in, in the urine. So I would like to uh, sum up is that, that uh, presumably under steady state, the kidney contributes to tolerance induction and maintenance against soluble antigens. However, the, the kidney is still a target organ for circulating antigens, antibody, and immune complexes, which get deposited in the, in the glomerula, where it elicits renal inflammation. The interstitial inflammation drives loss of um, kidney function. Interstitial inflammation can be driven as a, as a steroid in inflammation by PAMs and DAMs. And in other renal disorders, uh, such as lupus, um, or reactive B and T cells invade the kidneys and may drive local injury. Yeah, thanks for your attention and um, happy to take any questions. <laughs>